great deal younger. A neighborhood-friendly ballpark offered real grass, a hand-run scoreboard, and an intimate setting for not one, but two baseball teams. Born in Hard Arts, the original fast food restaurants offered hungry patrons a wide choice of delicacies. On the avenue. There was a time when movies were shown in theaters that featured gold-plated water fountains and marble stairways in addition to popcorn. And who can forget the thrills and chills of riding the Alps and the delights of walking the Midway at Old Willow Grove Park? All of these places, and many more, defined the pleasures of life in the Delaware Valley in the first three quarters of the 20th century. And they are all things that aren't there anymore. Before the modern theme parks were even dreamt of, the place to go for thrilling rides, exciting music, and visits to foreign lands was Willow Grove Park, the place where life was a lark. Up there where life is a lark, you bet it's Willow Grove Park. Not far from Philadelphia, they're happy and gay. Take my hand, you'll understand. You probably remember Willow Grove Park from childhood visits in the 50s and 60s. But the park wasn't just in the amusement business. It was created back in 1896 by the Union Traction Company, which was looking for a way to increase business for its trolley lines on the weekends. It was an instant sensation, alternating the speed of the mountain scenic railway with the sylvan splendor of a man-made lake and the patriotic melodies of the John Philip Sousa Band. When Willow Grove Park was built, it cost $500,000. The electric fountain cost one-fifth of the $500,000, which, when illuminated by the powerful electric lights, produced effects of marvelous beauty. Anita Smiley is a former school teacher turned amateur Willow Grove Park historian. Venice was a very popular um, amusement ride at Willow Grove Park. You rode in a gondola, and you never saw another gondola as you rode through Venice. As you rode in your gondola and went under the bridge, a mechanical man tipped his hat to you, and as you rode past the palaces, a lady waved her handkerchief at you. John Philip Sousa and his band came to Willow Grove during the concert period of 1901. They came every year, too, including 1926, except for 1911. Sousa's last year at Willow Grove Park was during the summer of 1926. It is noted that over 100,000 people were in Willow Grove Park that evening, and the very last number he directed in Willow Grove was the Stars and Stripes Forever. Many people in this area have very fond memories of Willow Grove Park. Some have met their future husband there. Some have come on their first date for a rowboat ride on the lake. And uh, recently a, a little lady came up with tears in her eyes saying that uh, she had met her husband at Willow Grove Park and just seeing those postcards reminded her of all those circumstances. The late Harold Webster worked at the park for many years. The basement of his home is a treasure trove of park memorabilia, maintained by his wife, Rita. The Willow Grove Park trolley was one of my husband's very, very favorite items that he's collected over the memorabilia of the Willow Grove Park. This trolley car was purchased by his uncle, who purchased it in, in, oh, when it was first made in 1903 by Lionel. And someone told me there's only about seven left in the world that are in the condition that this one is in, and it is running. Anyone who ever 
frequent at Willow Grove Park, I am sure, is very familiar with this sign. Have your age guessed. There were two particular things you did at this one stand. You had your age guest or you had your weight guest. The crowds around the stand were so great that everybody wanted to see how much you weighed, so nobody bothered getting to, on the scale that much. They all wanted their age guest. A day at Willow Grove Park wouldn't have been complete without a ride on the carousel. Both young and old all loved the carousel. The carousel you see here is a replica of the type that was used at the old Willow Grove Park, and the music you play is your authentic carousel music. Willow Grove Park in the northern suburbs and Woodside Park in West Philadelphia had one thing in common. They were built and operated by the transportation companies to provide more reasons for riding the streetcars. The Fairmount Park uh, Transportation Company uh, went into business in 1896. They built the uh, Strawberry Mansion Bridge across the Schuylkill River. That was built as part of the construction of the uh, Fairmount Park trolley line. It was very much a warm weather attraction, very much associated with Woodside Park. For the first half of this century, Philadelphia was a trolley town. By the 1920s, the city boasted a fleet of 2,000 streetcars, which rode on more than 550 miles of track. In Center City, Market, Arch, Chestnut, and Walnut Streets all were lined with trolley tracks as well as every numbered street from front to 23rd. In those days, streetcars were the last word in travel. for perhaps two dozen cities throughout the United States. The cars came in many different uh, models. Uh, some people may remember cars that uh, were what are known as double end, with operating controls at both ends. And either end could be the front or the rear. As you might imagine, in the days before the widespread use of automobiles, getting a group to and from a funeral was a bit involved and especially getting to and from the cemetery. So many transit systems, Philadelphia amongst them, provided a service where a special streetcar was fitted out for use by funerals. The car had a large uh, hatch in the side to allow uh, placing the uh, coffin inside the car. And then the car was run to the nearest point to the cemetery from the funeral home. The car was known as the hillside. Following the Second World War, streetcar ridership began to decline all over the country once automobiles became more available and gasoline was derationed. Tucker has a theory about all of this, and it's nothing if not provocative. There was a conspiracy to buy up useful rail transit properties and destroy them. And that firm was known as the National City Lines Company. They were owned by the General Motors Corporation, Firestone Tire and Rubber, and uh, some oil companies and um, took over the Philadelphia Transportation Company and sold almost as many assets as we still have today in the SEPTA system. Uh, several car houses and garages were closed, sold off a lot of vehicles and so forth. This was part of a nationwide program to uh, reduce the availability of public transportation and thereby sell more automobiles. There are still a few trolley lines operating in Philadelphia and they're kept rolling by a dedicated army of maintenance workers 
in depots all over the city, like this one at 58th and Calla Hill Streets in West Philadelphia. Men like Bob Hughes and his staff are fond of the old PCC, or President's Cars, just like the one we just rode on. They're sturdy and reliable, but have been phased out in recent years by the more streamlined LRV, or light rail vehicle. In fact, the last PCC car rolled out of the barn in September 1992 and into the memories of those who rode and worked on them for over 40 years. Most of the area's old movie palaces have come down in recent years, but they were everywhere in the old days. Center City had more than its share of these temples of cinema. Fox, Stanley, the Boyd, and many others. But two theaters stood out in their day from all the rest, the Mass Bomb and the Earl. Most people spend their misspent youths in pool rooms. I spent my misspent youth at the Earl Theater. And going to the Earl Theater so that you were there when they opened the doors at 10 o'clock on Friday morning and could go in, the movie started at 11 o'clock, and at 1 o'clock on came the stage show. Perhaps you had gone to see uh, Cab Calloway and his band, or Fletcher Henderson and his band, or Tommy Dorsey, or Benny Goodman, or whatever. Well, the inside of the, of the Earl Theater was uh, just almost beggar's description and made great use of marble, uh, lavish tapestries in the lounges and in the foyer. Uh, there was just a, a feeling of opulence all the way through. And this obtained even after the kids began to come in, the teenagers following the big band. We had a kind of a feeling that it was a hallowed place in its way. So nobody took any liberties with it, and everybody respected it. And it was indeed a, a most opulent place. The Mass Bomb Theater. How do you talk about the Mass Bomb Theater? It was a, well, first of all, it looked more like a Greek temple or a, a great museum than it looked like a theater. At the front, there were eight freestanding Doric columns, and they flung themselves skyward. and. It just was a magnificent thing. And one walked in, for example, into this huge lobby, the Fountain Lobby, which was the greeting place, the foyer, and everything just kind of circled around there as far as the first stage of your going into the theater was concerned. There were two grand staircases that looked like something that Ziegfeld must have designed for one of his shows. If you didn't want to walk up the staircases, there were eight elevators that took you to eight different levels of the uh, theater. And there were 4,700 seats, so you can see it was spread around pretty well. The men's room and the ladies' room, I am told, uh, were just extensions of somebody's mansion. But it was a great old place, except for one thing. It never could make any money. In addition to cost, post-war movie theaters faced challenges from television as well. Worried moguls from the major studios decided to give moviegoers an experience they couldn't find at home. Experiences like the widescreen cinemascope. The wraparound cinerama. And the ultimate gimmick, 3D. Objects seemingly jumped out of the screen and into the laps of audiences who donned effective, but not very stylish, 3D glasses. Producers and theater owners also got into the act, especially in promoting horror films. They went as far as to hand out vomit bags to their unsuspecting patrons, just in case the chills became too intense. The bags came complete with very important instructions. Despite Hollywood's best efforts, 
movie attendance declined dramatically over the years. In 1941, Philadelphia was home to 380 single-screen theaters, of which exactly five survive to this day. The Aldine at 19th and Chestnut Streets is one of them, known today as Sam's Place. Alan Goodkin remembers the Aldine's heyday. He was an usher, and in those days it was a job that was second in importance only to the managers and involved almost military training. They assembled a staff of ushers for training about 60 or 65, and we did the military training, uh, marched up and down the stairs, uh, marched to our posts, exchanged flashlights in a military manner as you would a rifle or a guard on duty. The flashlight was held um, not grasped, it was held slightly in a, in a wand position with the button up so that you could flash the light. When you escorted them to the row in which they were seated, you would indicate by the flashlight the row entrance. You were never permitted to shine the flashlight above the tops of a man's shoe or above the top of a lady's ankle for decorum's sake. Most of the patrons uh, that came into the theater were well-dressed, well-behaved, uh, evenings, coats and ties, uh, ladies in their furs and jewelry, uh, and every evening was a real gala occasion. Today, when you want to traverse the Delaware River, one of these is the way to go. But there was a time, not so long ago, before the days of the suspension bridges, that ferry boats were as thick on the river as buses are on Market Street today. In fact, when another ferry was launched, it was a major civic occasion. Ferries haven't completely disappeared on the Delaware. Tourists visiting the New Jersey State Aquarium at Camden can get a taste of the ferry experience. But the only working ferry on the river today plies the waters between the Philadelphia Navy Yard and National Park, New Jersey. It's a private service for use by Navy Yard workers, and it's piloted by Captain Gene Smith. Along for the ride on this trip were members of the Steamship Historical Society and they had some yarns to spin about the old days on the river. One of the great pleasures of my young life was to take the big yellow trolley down to the ferry on the loop, get off and walk into that huge cavernous building which served the railroad as well, and we paid our nickel, got on the ferry, in great anticipation as the crew released the hooks on the end of the boat, and you could hear the bell on the the engine began to turn and whistle tooted, and off he went for this very short trip across the river. At that time, Philadelphia was not noted for the quality of its drinking water, and there was a water fountain in the ferry, in the Philadelphia ferry house, and it smelled and tasted like the intake pipe went right through the floor into the river. It was Really you had to be pretty thirsty. I can remember riding a ferry when I was a kid in the first place. Uh, I always had it for <coughs> the deckhands weren't looking around. <coughs> I used to head right for the center structure, which led you down into the engine room. Yes. And 
I was always fascinated with a steam engine and still am today. If it's still steam, that's right where I head the heck with the wheelhouse. So I go to the engine room. And once you got down there, they let you walk around. If you made it down and nobody stopped you beforehand. One of the great pleasures a little boy could have would get on a ferry when you had big ice flows and the uh, ferry boat would hit those ice flows and grind it up and make a lot of noise. And uh, that was a real thrill. And uh, that would happen once in a while when you have enough ice to come down and the flows would be maybe two foot thick, three foot thick. Yes, they used to do that, but it never stopped them. The completion of the Ben Franklin Bridge in 1926 signaled a 26 year march to oblivion for the commercial ferries. In 1952, the last of the ferries took its final voyage on the Delaware. And I remember it being a fairly uh, cold, windy night and somebody asked me what the mood was, and I have since came to the conclusion it was kind of like an Irish wake where there was celebration going on, but without getting too uh, dramatic about it, there was a overshadowing. It was the fact that uh, sadness at losing a, I guess, an old friend, you'd old say. Friend, but yeah, uh, yeah. I was on that last trip, and I hung off <laughs> the back rail as far as I could hang in the middle of the back rail so I would be the last body across the river. <laughs> Somebody else got their name in the paper, but I was the last body. <laughs> it was, as, as Norm says, it was a sad, sweet kind of a moment. You remember Horn and Hardart, the stainless steel keeper of culinary delights, the coin-operated window dispenser. For a meager few coins, you were entitled to choose from a wide selection of delicacies. Everything from delicious cherry pie, hot dogs, to macaroni and cheese. Horn and Hard Arts automats meant less work for mother. As I recall, for three nickels, which you would put into the old slots and then move the crank, uh, it was two nickels for a uh, plate of, or a pot of baked beans, and it was one nickel for a cup of coffee or a soft drink. And you just sat there and re-fortified yourself on baked beans and, say, Coca-Cola. Joseph V. Horn and Frank Hardart founded their restaurant chain in 1888 and installed the first automat in America in 1902 at this location, currently the home of a drugstore. One of the tangential attractions of a Horn and Hard Art was the lady who made change in the middle of every establishment. Uh, she was known as a nickel thrower because of the grime that was on these nickels and they kept tossing them out hour after hour with only a five minute break, I think every 60 minutes. They picked up all of this grime from these nickels and they were the worst sight that you ever saw. So, when I think of Horn and Hard Art, I think of the nickel throwers, and I think of the statuesque lady, and I try not to think of her hands. I used to do a nickel throw in my time, and it, I never cared for it, but uh, you would uh, get, they would put money down, and you would just flip off five nickels at a time for a quarter, and they gave you 50 cents, you'd go into the next slot and throw another five nickels and uh, by the end of the day oh your hands would be absolutely filthy from the uh, the nickels they were so black and uh, I only did it a few times and I hated it completely <laughs> all the restaurants seemed to attract a certain kind of people you had Kensington and Allegheny a working group of people you had 15th and market across from City Hall where you had the lawyers and the politicians and you also had all the gangsters and the gangsters were their best customers because it was a nice place for them to meet the waitresses loved them because they were great tippers and they took care of themselves. I mean, nobody touched anybody <laughs> in those places. Where they were. And then there was another area, which was 11th Street, which was the street walkers' paradise. <laughs> and they would come in, and they had their own table in the restaurant every night. I mean, this is just some of the crazy things that I remember uh, 
from Horn and Hargitz. Do you know there was a whole section at 818 Chestnut, which was the original, and these were jewelers from Jewelers Row, and it would be nothing for them to spill a bag of diamonds on the table, and they sat around the table and haggled over what did their business. So uh, they were they they came in very handy in their day for the public or the artists. The original automat at 818 Chestnut closed in 1968, with others following soon after. With them went a style of service and cuisine that you just don't see anymore. If you had to make a list of favorite childhood memories, one of them might be the first time you set foot in Connie Mack Stadium and marveled at the sight of an emerald green playing field and an outfield wall festooned with advertising posters. The stadium, originally known as Shibe Park, hosted the American League Athletics and later the National League Philly in 1909 through 1970. The NFL Eagles also called it home and played the 1948 championship game there. Shibe Park also hosted political conventions and other events in its 62-year lifetime. It was the nation's first concrete and steel ballpark, built for the princely sum of $1 million. For all of that, Shy Park fit neatly into the fabric of its North Philadelphia neighborhood. That's a fact that architect and planner Leon Clemmer should know all too well. His grandfather, Joseph Steele, built the place. It was a community. It was a community of Shy Park. The players, the groundskeepers, everybody knew everybody. They walked to the park, they played together, they, re, re, they went to the same, the churches were right, down, right around the community. This is the great thing about the way the industrial Philadelphia was. It was the same as any big industrial building. It was a place of work, it was a place of play, and people congregated around it. The people that worked there lived there. When they coined the term friendly confines, they met Wrigley Field in Chicago but they could have had Shy Park in mind. The sight lines were excellent in Shy Park. No matter where you sat in the main sta uh, seats, the main stadium, you had tremendous sight lines. You could see that ball field. It was built for baseball. Babe Ruth used to break windows on 20th Street with some of his home runs and would launch some of his shots over the roofs. The neighborhood setting was so cozy that relief pitchers would sometimes drop by the local tap room in uniform for a spot of liquid refreshment during slow ball games. In the late 20s and early 30s, when the A's sported some memorable World Series teams, neighbors across the right field wall on 20th Street capitalized on the demand for series tickets by building bleachers on their roofs and admitting fans for half price. They'd send their children to local vendors to buy hot dogs for a nickel and resell them to their rooftop fans for a dime. Business boomed for these neighborhood entrepreneurs until 1935, when stadium co-owner John Scheib decided he couldn't endure the competition any longer. He erected a 38-foot addition to the right field fence, blocking the view from across 20th Street. The rooftop bleachers were put out of business. The Phillies' greatest success in their Connie Mack Stadium years came during the era of the Whiz Kids, of the late 40s and early 50s. A charter member of the Whiz Kids was Richie Ashburn, who achieved fame with the Phillies first as a player and later as a broadcaster. I'll tell you what, what impressed me about Connie Mack Stadium the first time I walked into it was the number of people. There were about 35,000 people there. It was a sellout. I had never seen that many people in one spot before. And that, I mean, the, the awesome size of it and the noise of all those people, I had, uh, I grew up in Tilden, Nebraska, population around a thousand. Just the, the noise and the size and, and the beautiful uh, playing field was, was very impressive to me. That's one of the, one of the most, uh, uh, that was one of the best moments, I think, in my major league career, really, was that first day in the Connie Mack Stadium. I was a center fielder, of course. It was a perfect outfield for a center fielder. It was huge. Center field cover a lot of ground, so I had a lot of room to roam. And, and once again, the grass out there was, was just manicured 
Uh, you, you could charge a ball without fear of, you know, a bad hop. And uh, it was probably the best outfield for a center fielder in the league at that time. Our groundskeeper used to build up the line a little, the third base foul line a little bit for me. So the bunt that went down that line wouldn't roll foul. And, and some people would think that's cheating. I'll tell you what it was, it was equal time because when I went on the road, they did just the opposite. They built the line so it tapered so the ball would roll foul. For all of the Wiz kids, their most exciting experience at Connie Mack Stadium was the 1950 World Series against the powerhouse New York Yankees. It was a great thrill because there hadn't been a pennant one in Philadelphia uh, since 1915, and of course in 1950, that was 35 years later, it was, it was certainly the highlight of all our careers, we, and we were young. We were called the whiz kids, and we were all young. I was only, I think, 22 years old then, and uh, one of the oldest guys would have been Dal Ennis, who may have been 25 or 26, so uh, we, we, it was disappointing in that we lost four games in a row to the Yankees. Our club was really beat up. We, we, won, we won the National League pennant uh, in uh, Brooklyn on the last day of the season. Now the Yankees in the, in the American League had clinched their pennant, I think about two or three weeks ahead of the time. So they were strong and well rested and chomping at the bit, raring to go. We didn't get blown out of those games. We lost the first game one to nothing. Uh, we lost the second game two to one in ten innings when Joe DiMaggio beat us, beat Robin Roberts with a home run uh, in the tenth inning. We lost the third game three to two, and I think the last game was, that we lost in Yankee Stadium, I believe the score was five to three. I should remember that, but I don't. But it was uh, it was a great thrill, but it was very disappointing. And I think the greatest disappointment of all was the fact that we never won again. Ultimately, it was the transportation that killed that site. You remember as well as I do, you would park, you would have some little guy come up and say, hey, watch your car. Yes, you give me $5. It was a real con job. If you didn't pay it, your car was, it was a terrible thing, but they didn't have enough parking. That's why it was moved. It was the transportation that made the site originally. It's a, it's a funny analogous that uh, one thing made it and then the same thing killed it. Connie Mack Stadium opened its doors for the last time on October 1st, 1970, with the Phillies entertaining the Montreal Expos. Thousands of fans began lining up hours beforehand, and they had more than the game on their minds. And I think the, the reaction by the fans, not after the game, after the game, but even during the game, this, it started maybe the sixth or seventh inning you know, people said, hey, I'd like to get a souvenir out of here. By the sixth inning of the game, the sounds of ad hoc demolition could be heard all over the stadium. And when the Phillies finally won the game in the bottom of the 10th inning, all you know what broke loose. And all of a sudden, everybody is ripping the seats apart. And maybe where we were, way up there on top, was the safest place to be right then. And I thought, well, yeah, what, what are they going to do about this? I mean, the place is, the place is being literally torn apart right before our eyes. And I thought, these people are crazy. And then I looked down and saw my two sons down there <laughs> ripping off a seat. And I, believe it or not, I still have that seat. Let's take another look at that play on instant replay. It takes four seconds from the moment the winning run is scored for the kid to get his mitts on home plate in a futile bid for the ultimate souvenir. You'll see how quickly he realizes that the plate is firmly secured in the dirt and decides to grab the next item that isn't nailed down. By the time it was all over, souvenir hunters had taken seats, bats, gloves, baseballs, the sod, snack tins from concession stands, even toilets and sinks from the restrooms. It was an inglorious farewell for a grand old park. And even Saturday was to come for Old Shibe Park. In August 1971, vandals broke into the stadium, 
and set a small fire just for the thrill of it. The blaze spread and claimed much of the steel support, the roof, and the decks along third base. Connie Mack Stadium, once hailed as the largest and most perfectly appointed baseball grounds in the world, had become a derelict, fit for habitation only by rats. The wrecking ball finally put it out of its misery in 1976. Today, the site has found new life as the home of the 5,000-seat Deliverance Evangelistic Church, a temple of faith where once stood a temple of sport. In the old days when you went down the shore, the place to go was Atlantic City, one of the most glamorous resorts on the East Coast. It boasted a beautiful beach, a lively boardwalk, and elegant hotels. And the show place of Atlantic City was the Steel Pier, the vaudeville center of the boardwalk. In its heyday, the Steel Pier hosted some of the biggest names in show business, along with exciting daredevil acts. If you frequented the Steel Pier from the 40s to the 60s, your host was probably a man whose vocal skills would later make him well known to a generation of sports fans. He's Gene Hart, the voice of the Flyers. Not only that, but he's also married to the lady who rode the diving horse. So my life was New York school in the, in the winter and then to Atlantic City from Memorial Day to Labor Day on Steel Pier. Uh, as I matured and got out of the service, I started doing other jobs on the pier. I, instead of being a, a, a child fake Hawaiian diver, I became a stagehand, I became a gun holder for a lion tamer, became a comedy diver, assistant stage manager to my father, and uh, that career went on until the, the pier's demise. So we had pretty much of a 40-year situation. In fact, my ultimate end was going from uh, the fake Hawaiian diver and the son of the stage manager to the announcer of the water show. And I think technically that was the first work that I did uh, as a broadcaster of sorts. And of course the other thing was my wife came up from Florida in, in the late 50s as the diver of the famed Steel Pier Diving Horse and that's where we met. After my freshman year in college I got an audition. So I came up, went up to the top of the tower on the horse and that was my audition and got the job was still cold out. It was early spring. I was scared to death. <laughs> so it does take more than anything courage just to do it. But the act itself I never thought was that difficult. What you have to do is just simply get on the horse and hang on tightly and go along for the ride. But it was up to the horse. A lot of people think that we either shoved them off or they had electrical charge or something like that. Not so. They simply went up there and when they wanted to go, they went. Now when the horse got up, you began to realize as an MC that they had little idiosyncrasies. You know, the horse, he'd look out the seat, look down, do things like this, right? You know how they would. So if you could say it, you'd say, how are things out at the ocean? The horse would go like this. How are things at the boardwalk? Everything going okay? You all set? And people loved that because you knew the idiosyncrasies. But it always, for all of the years that the Steel Pier Water Show was there, that was the closing act, and it was the act for which many people came to see. So that was our life. Uh, it was a tough job because you worked every day. And the shows, it's almost how you remember, they, on, on weekdays there were 2, 4, 8, and 10. Then on Saturday nights you'd do, so you would do 2, 4, 8, 9, 30, and 11. And then on Sundays you would do 2, 3, 30, 5, 8, and 10. So we did 5, 5, we did 30 shows a week. And then that night between the 8 o'clock show and our 10.30 show, we'd go into the ballroom and stand right up at the stage and look up at Tex Benneke or Glenn Miller or Gene Krupa or Carmen Cavallero. Uh, I mean, every band that was known came in. I remember one time when I saw Betty Grable come in in a white fur coat because Harry James was there. Well, television came in. And television obviously would pay more for one show on Ed Sullivan or the Kate Smith show or the Sid Caesar show than you could make for 30 shows in Atlantic City. So the, the concept of Steel Pier became passe. In fact, I, I, uh, she knows we, we, don't, we don't even go on the boardwalk where we can see Steel Pier. It aggravates us, you know, to see and say, do you remember what it used to be? But the important thing out of it all is if, if, if it had not been for Steel Pier, we certainly would never have met. No. So not only do we enjoy them and savor the fine memories of those, that time, yeah. 
but we realized that it was fate. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, here we are yeah. because of Steel Pier. There's another area of town that is looking to recapture its past glory. From the 40s through the 60s, Kentucky Avenue between Atlantic and Arctic was jumping 24 hours a day with the sounds of jazz and rhythm and blues and the aromas of barbecue. Patty Harris remembers those days when she danced in Larry Steele's Smart Affairs at the focal point of Kentucky Avenue, the Club Harlem. We were called the Beige Buttes and the Beige Bows. It's always more girls than fellas. It's always four fellas and maybe, um, I would say roughly about 20 girls. And um, we would do two shows a night, uh, three on Saturday night, Sunday morning. We had that wonderful breakfast show uh, that started at 6 a.m. And a lot of celebrities from all over uh, the city would come in, you know, like Frank Sinatra and work with people like um, Jackie Wilson, or Roy Hamilton, um, Marvin Gaye, and the list just goes on and on. The people would be lined up from Atlantic Avenue waiting to get in to see these shows. And even though uh, it was a black review, the audience was primarily white and uh, the whole street was ablaze. We started uh, rehearsing uh, in June, the show would open July and we worked to September. All these things were just uh, just weren't really wonderful times. The costumes, the hats, the girls and the food out here on Kentucky Avenue going to the fishery and saps for ribs and Jerry's for ribs and up to Miss Johnson's for soul food. And, it was just wonderful. And then you'd eat and then you'd go to the beach and you'd have beach parties or just sleep. So, I mean, I think after working all night, you're too, really too hyped up to, to go home and sleep. So you go on the beach and party a little bit more and just, you're there for a while. Kentucky Avenue may well swing again if Yvonne Doggett's Kentucky Avenue Renaissance has anything to do with it. The Renaissance uh, was held early June uh, I thought that perhaps we could recreate uh, that which went on here in Kentucky Avenue, recreate the ambiance, the sights, the sounds, and the smells of this particular street that meant so much to not just the black community, but um, all groups in the community. Grace's Little Belmont has been closed for 17 years, and now uh, it opened for the festival. When you walked in there, it was as if it had never closed. There was a band on the bandstand playing, and they were playing April in Paris, because that's what was playing in the organ of the big stage here at the Club Harlem. I was happy to note at the end when the numbers came in uh, that we had over 10,000 people a day. And they came from the Delaware Valley. They came from Washington, D.C., from Philadelphia, from New York. But what I would love to encourage, as we restore Atlantic City, we don't lose the, um, the feeling and the heart and the passion of our community. It's slow. Everything is slow, it seems, when you really want it. But if it's really good, it will happen. Will the Steel Pier at Kentucky Avenue be reborn in a rejuvenated Atlantic City? Maybe, if memories are translated into action. Today, Market Street East looks a lot different than it did as few as 10 years ago. It's still the department store hub of Center City, but not like the old days, when the street was lined with stores like Strawbridge's and Wanamaker's, which are still there, and Stellenberg's, Gimbel's, and Frank and Cedar's, which are not. Probably the most visually memorable of all the bygone Market Street stores was Lip Brothers on Market Street between 7th and 8th. Thanks to Mellon Bank, which rescued it from the Wreckers Ball in 1984, Litz still stands as the home of Mellon's operations center. Actually, Litz isn't one building. It's a group of several different structures that the Litz family either purchased or built starting in 1893. The result is a giant gingerbread cake of a structure, the city's largest remaining cluster of 19th century iron and stone fronted commercial buildings. 
And if you looked a little more closely at the corners of the building at 7th and 8th Street, you'd notice a slogan which may prove a bit puzzling to modern day passersby. Hats trimmed free of charge. We thought we'd ask a few of those passersby just what that means. I guess it just means to cut your head or make an old hat look new. <laughs> I don't know. Guys, want to help me out here? Hats trimmed. I don't think I've ever heard that saying. Well, when you buy a hat in the old days, I think it was just women. And um, they would like mold the hat and like shape it to the individual's head, maybe. <laughs> For those of you who may be mystified still, let an expert demonstrate how it's done. Lit Brothers had an excellent um, millinery department and um, they had something that none of the other stores had and that was the, um, the customer would come in and pick out her hat and then also be able to uh, choose her trimming. I'm taking this ribbon and pleating it in to a rosette type of a thing which you can see and then I'm going to put it right here on the hat. It's like everything else, it's an art. Anything that's um, a little bit different, you have to um, have training for it. We used to use the suede trimmings and also all kinds of feathers. Dailing was very uh, popular in those days. They would take the hat and drape it so that the um, the veil would come down nose length, which was very attractive looking in those days. I see a, a comeback in millinery because I noticed in all our the fashion shows this year, and practically every model is wearing a hat. So that uh, looks like a possibility of uh, introducing our ladies <clears throat> back to uh, wearing a hat, which is very feminine to finish off your outfit, I think. Now that's hat trimming. Lit Brothers went out of business in 1977, and Gimbel's, another major Market Street chain, followed soon after. Gimbel's won't be remembered for the splendor of its store at 8th and Market. What gave Gimbel's its claim to immortality? at least for two generations of kids, was its sponsorship of the annual Thanksgiving Day Parade, starting in 1920. Every year, until the store's closing, the parade would wind its way east on the parkway, around City Hall, and east on Market Street to the store. The grand finale featured the arrival of Santa Claus, who would receive the keys to the city, and then ascend a fire truck ladder into the fourth floor of Gimbel. It just wasn't Christmas in Philadelphia until Santa Claus did his thing. I was a Philadelphia fireman stationed at Tent and Cherry, and it was the custom that a fireman would be Santa Claus in the Gimbel's Day Parade because Ladder 23 that was stationed in the firehouse was the ladder that Santa Claus would climb up to get into the old Gimbel's building. And the battalion chief said that I was the fattest guy there and that I would fit right into it. And, and that's how it all began for me. And that was uh, the Santa Claus floats uh, were not of great quality. They were uh, tied together with clothesline. They had little casters on the bottom. And it was just like a pallet that the sled was mounted on and you would hold on for dear life. In the event that the Santa Claus would fall off the sleigh, the parade could continue and the backup Santa Claus would go on. It was like the show must go on, you know, that kind of thing. We'd go through the parade and you would wave the entire length and the Gimbel's parade would end at Gimbel's. The queen of the parade would be there and she would give the key from the, for the city to Santa Claus to open up the holidays and when all that publicity stuff was done Santa Claus would put a bag of toys on his back and he would climb up the ladder and this is something that very few people 
will ever be able to vision what I've seen. I would go up a half a dozen rungs on the ladder, turn around, and look over Market Street in any given direction, and it was covered with people from down as far as 7th Street at one end, at the other end as far up as probably 10th or 11th. It was nothing but people. I purchased for my own personal use a pair of Santa Claus glasses, like the old Ben Franklin kind. And this one year, I happened to forget to take the glasses with me when I left the house. And the makeup man said, just wear the ones you have on, which are very similar to what I'm wearing now. He said, they'll look perfectly fine. Not thinking that these glasses were photo gray glasses. We got to the end of the parade and they're photographing and they, all of a sudden, they're asking why Santa Claus is wearing sunglasses. Never thinking that I was wearing photo gray glasses. Well, that was my last year as doing Santa Claus because I really don't believe that Commissioner Rizzo appreciated Santa Claus wearing sunglasses. And I feel it, that that was one of the reasons that I kind of lost my job. <laughs> to be Santa Claus and to be Santa Claus for a long time. It was one of the highlights of my life, really. Every week, a group of salespeople, secretaries, bankers, and housewives gather at the Aztec Club on Delaware Avenue to do the Bristol Stump, the Twist, and the 81. There are a few of the dances they used to do as teenagers at Wagner's Ballroom in North Philadelphia. And the man spinning the discs at the Aztec today, just as he did at Wagner's 30 years ago, is the geeter with the heater, the boss with the hot sauce, Jerry Blapp. In 1962, at 5810 Old York Road, there was a ballroom known as Wagner's. And up until 1962, this place was probably the hottest ballroom in America for adult dancing. But then in 1962, something happened. We went in there with some of these kids that you see here today. And for nine years straight, Wagner's Ballroom became the hottest teenage dance hall in America with 2,000 kids every Sunday afternoon. These beyond teens, as we say, when they were kids that were called young teenagers, met, fell in love at Wagner's Ballroom at Broad and Ollery. It was the place that people could go. If they didn't have a lot of money, could always go to the dance and have a ball for hours. And there were tons of kids there. You didn't even have to know anybody. You could just go there and jump in and get in a line dance and have a ball. We met in Nice Town, and I talked her into going to Wagner's with me. She said, no, I can't go there. I said, come on, go with me. We went there, fell in love with the place, fell in love with the people, and it's history. You got the lips that are not about to. I got the lips that are not going to come on. Wild, 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 be wild about me. Oh, yeah. We used to dance so much from the beginning to the end that we all used to get soaked and wet and sweat, and the um, mirrors around Wagner's ballroom would steam up. <laughs> and people would say, well, when we walk outside, is it raining? No, it's not raining. We're just having a ball and having a wonderful time. <laughs> We would name all of these wonderful dances that these kids came up with from the spot that they were dancing. And at that time, it was Wagner's Ballroom, so we called it the Wagner Walk, or the Shabu Walk, or the Riviera Roll, or the Jerry Strut. Jerry, that was also a way that kids dealt with um, competition. Instead of having fights, they danced it out. They, you know, this one was better than that one, and they would dance it out, right on the boardwalk, whether it was down the shore or on the corner or at the dance halls. That's how they competed with one another. Rather than with fists, they did it with the dance techniques. That was also another way that the girls and guys got together, because sometimes the guys would make up a dance, but they didn't want a bunch of guys going out there by themselves. That wasn't done in those days. So they needed girls to go out with them, so we would meet and get together and do it with them. So one of the requirements to really meet a guy, he had to be a good dancer, folks. If he could, listen, if he couldn't dance, there was no romance. And I must tell you something, I think we have to go back to those days because I think that kids today need a Wagner's Borum. And more than need, they themselves are looking for the camarada. 
to meet new kids other than the neighborhood kids and see the way other kids live. You became their friends because of the dances and you saw the way that they lived in those days. Terrific TV audience, I mean that sincerely. Let's give them a big hand, a big hand over here for these people. Huh? Thank you, thank you, bye, bye, bye. Okay. We put this program together because there's nothing more fun than remembering the old days, and because there's no place in the country richer in happy memories than the Delaware Valley. We're sorry that those things aren't there anymore, but we're glad that we were around to enjoy them when they were. This is Bill Campbell.